and being able to tailor it around family life, work, you know, to get that blend just right. So yeah, it's flexibility definitely. You're not just learning skills that you to, yeah. to prove that you can learn. It's it's actually you know it's work that'll get used and, and therefore um, you, you put a bit more work into it. It meant I could concentrate on work and so continue my career. And um, fitting in around work and take some organising, but. I chose Postmore because of the flexibility in the delivery of a uh, course. Uh, I'm still working and uh, I couldn't have uh, the time to come in for a full time and uh, I thought whilst working and still be able to do it online, that was great for me. Well, I live in Portugal, so I'm from this area, so it fits in my job and the family. The important thing for me is to be able to maintain uh, my current job and uh, not impact on my family too much. I'm feeling really happy that I've actually got a distinction in my MSc. So it's all the work that I've put in for four years on this learning. Well, I feel very good inside. Um, it's been a while coming and, uh, you know, I've got a sense of achievement. I feel out of this world. I feel happy. I feel fulfilled. I feel that today I have really achieved my dream of being a graduate of this great university of Boston. Have you been looking and waiting for opportunities to be globally competitive? How long have you been searching for a way to enhance and align your academic documents without leaving your job or spend long hours studying? Wait and search no more. Ralph Consulting, the Academic Consultant Board of Philippines of the London Institute of Business and Technology, LIBT, can help you align your academic documents and be globally competitive. With LIBD's diploma and degree programs, you will be able to get the competencies and certifications you have been waiting for for only a short time. Plus, you may apply for a scholarship grant that will give you a 50% discount on your tuition fee. What are you waiting for? For quick processing and approval of scholarship applications, visit rlbalmaceda.com slash education or email at ralph at libt.co.uk. Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you to the ACT Local Think Global webinar series of the London Institute of Business and Technology, LIBT. Well, LIBT Philippines has organized a series of webinars entitled Global Competitiveness Amidst COVID-19 and Beyond to discuss the challenges and opportunities ushered in by the new normal uh, in relation to industries of hospitality and tourism, information technology, and business management. The second of the series for information technology is happening right now. We welcome our participants from various campuses and offices of LIBT, namely London, England, Bangkok, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and of course, from the various regions and provinces of the Philippines. Welcome one and all. We also want to greet uh, those students uh, from the LIBD from various campuses all over the world. We also want to greet those from the UTAOA who joined us in the first uh, series of this webinar. Now, before I proceed, Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jerome Robles, and some of my friends call me Rome. I am the host 
and producer of the live show in TriPH Media Broadcasting, which airs live Monday, Wednesday, and Friday every 2 p.m. Philippine time, where we discuss many topics over Facebook Live and YouTube Live, covering travel, tourism, and technology topics in and around the archipelago. Now, I'm also a guest anchor in the morning show, Kai Gandang Morning Pilipinas, in DWIZ 882 AM Radio Nationwide, which airs Monday through Fridays, 5 AM to 6 AM. Now, while I'm not in the academe, or I'm not from the academe, I'm also into training and facilitation under the team of Ralph Balmaceda, the Deputy Country Director of LIBT Philippines. Now, I have worked with Professor Ralph since 2016. Uh, we handled training development in the fields of safety, emergency preparedness, process control, and improvement, to name a few. By the way, I am moderating all the webinars of the series, so thank you for all of those who attended the first of the series of the webinar and are back here again together with us. I also hope that you will attend the third of the series, which will happen in September. Now, before we start, let me share to you some important reminders. First of all, whether you are watching live via Facebook or YouTube, please make sure to comment below to confirm your attendance. Now, you can type your full name, comma, your organization or school, comma, and your location. Now, please see the example that is now being shown on the screen below. Note that even if you are registered, if you do not have proof of any participation, no certificate will be issued towards you. Now, secondly, just in case you are watching now, but you are not yet registered, well, it's okay, and you are welcome to join. But to claim a certificate of participation, please make sure that you register on the link that you see on the screens right now. You can still register during this webinar and we will send your certificate. Make sure you stay until the end of the whole program. There will be an announcement later on regarding certificates. And finally, there will also be a question and answer portion, just like any beauty contest. Well, this is not a beauty contest, but there will be a beauty, I mean, a question and answer portion after all the presentations. And you may be involved in this particular part. Kindly type your question in the comment box and I will read and present your questions in the screen. Now, please indicate as to whom you would like to direct your questions to. Here is an example of a question as you will see here on the screen. Now, this webinar is made possible to us by our partners, the London Institute of Business and Technology Philippines team, Modala Beach Resort, the Filipino Hospitality, Martin Nichols Consulting, Ralph Consulting, TriPH Media Broadcasting, Phil Robotics, University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines, Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers Brunei Chapter. So, let's get this webinar started. Begin by introducing our first speaker. Our first speaker is the Director for Academic Affairs of the London Institute of Business and Technology. She has over 10 years of experience in education, social and health services in Thailand and Switzerland. She is an inclusive leader who understands the importance of creating caring, reflective, collaborative and supportive communities that foster educational and workforce excellence as well as social and emotional well-being of individuals in the learning organization. She strongly believes that education may be employed in ending poverty and discrimination. In her role as a leader and educational consultant, she invests her time in developing and coaching others. Our speaker finished her bachelor's degree in education and psychology at Asia Pacific International University and recently earned a certificate in School Management and Leadership at Harvard Business School Online. She is here to introduce to us the London Institute of Business and Technology and its program. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Ms. Na Thane.
So uh, let's uh, unmute the uh, now first so we can uh, hear you. Thank you. Thank for you the very much. <laughs> Go ahead, please. I would just. Uh, this is such an exciting event for all of us. And I've been told that there are about a thousand participants. Uh, so what an honor to be here. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, happy Harpen Po. My name is No Thing, and, and I'm the Director of Academic uh, Affairs at London Institute of Business and Technology. And I'm here, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about um, a brief overview of LIBT and the services that we provide. Okay, so uh, LIBT is a digital-centric tech company, and we offer qualify and ATHE accredited um, qualifications. So level four, five, and seven in business, uh, startups and entrepreneurship, travel and tourism, education, human resource, uh, accounting and finance, law, and of course, the reason why we're all here for, um, for IT. So we have uh, computer science, IT, and cybersecurity qualification. So both qualify, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the qualification. So qualify and ATHE are recognized um, UK awarding organization, and they are regulated in England by the Office of Qualifications and Examinations uh, Regulation, known as uh, OFQA. And you might be wondering, what, uh, what does level four, five, seven uh, may, uh, stand for? So level four uh, is equivalent to the first year of undergraduate program. Level five is uh, the second year. And level seven is equivalent to the first year of, uh, of a master program. So we, uh, LIBT, uh, currently have direct progression or top-up arrangement with University of Portsmouth, as you saw in the very beginning, um, and then University of Northampton, uh, and many other universities that are directly in a partnership with Qualify and ATHE um, our organizations. Okay, We are trying to expand our program. We're in the process of expanding our uh, progression agreement to other universities in Asia and Australia. And successful graduates of our program, our diploma programs, are eligible for a direct entry. So you don't need to worry about oh, um, whether you know you'll be you have um, uh, entry. Uh, you will be able to go through the admission process. There will be a direct entry um, into a relevant undergraduate or postgraduate top-up programs uh, at these universities. So, for example, um, we we recently have uh, uh, students who finished uh, level seven, a qualified level seven uh, diploma in strategic management and leadership, and they are now applying directly uh, for MA in business and computer science uh, at the University of Portsmouth uh, through us, through ILBT. So that is very exciting for us. Uh, LIBT operates in. Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan, and we currently have uh, about 400 plus students uh, studying in various disciplines. Um, and uh, in regards to today's topic, LIBT aims to stay relevant. It's all about staying relevant um, uh, in this fast changing IT and business roles. And how do we do it? We, we do this by uh, providing robust and realistic plans to prepare our students for the workforce globally. Uh, and being industry driven, uh, we, we've identified gaps in, uh, in education and we're trying to bridge those gaps between academia and industry. Um, technology in, uh, technological innovation is the heart of what we do. Uh, we are a college as a service platform. So what it means is that we have taken all the behavior that we have seen in classic software um, uh, as a service or SES, and we try to incorporate it in uh, those behavior into education and make sure that uh, you know, our students are uh, get getting relevant information, are uh, being able to truly apply and be ready to uh, to go into the workforce. Um, so, for instance, we provide students uh, 30 days uh, free trials 
We also allow them to make uh, monthly payments to set up um, and, and also help them set up uh, self-served accounts and support them through digital channels so that you're they are familiar with with all these tools uh, while they're studying with us and they'll be able to apply when they go to the the workforce so in a nutshell uh, ilb2 provides a quick and affordable education um, education option for learning the most up-to-date and relevant skills to enter the workforce. So please um, check out our website, www.libt.co.uk for more information. And thank you for joining us today and wish you all the best. Um, and I'll see you um, uh, in Q&A sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Na Thane, for helping us understand all of those programs and how it will work if you join LIBT programs today. So you have that opportunity now, having heard of that. And so we will continue on with more of our learnings in the topic for today by introducing the next speaker. Of course, the next speaker has, really doesn't need much introduction. He is the man of LIBT and we are honored for his presence this afternoon. He finished advanced level mathematics at Royal College Colombo and bachelor's in computer science at, at South Arkansas University and bachelor's in business and management at North Umbria University. He earned his MBA in Australian Institute of Business and postgraduate diploma in international business law at LIBT. He has a solid track record as an auditor, lecturer, manager and consultant in the IT industry. Currently, he is an honorary director of the Tarunyata Heta, or Aspiring Youth Sri Lanka, CEO of United Management and Consulting Group, non-executive director of the Beta Park Bhutan, and of course, the CEO of the London Institute of Business and Technology. Let us all welcome Cesare Matirani. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Rom, for that uh, um, warm uh, introduction. Um, thank you very much. And, and um, uh, it, it's it's definitely an honor to be here. Um, you know, I mean, I'm looking at the live stream as well, and there are a lot of uh, uh, live viewers as well. Uh, so it's wonderful. And, and kudos to our, our Philippines team, uh, especially uh, John and Ralph. And you guys have done an amazing job organizing these events and of course uh, um, try PH media thank you you guys I mean you guys have uh, done a phenomenal job uh, as well um, <clears throat> so with that said I think uh, the the um, conversation today uh, is basically around how this post covid uh, world is going to look like uh, you know after this pandemic is over and um, of course you know we, we all have different weaves and different uh, uh, players in the market are saying different things but but I, I like to kind of uh, um, start this conversation uh, f f from a standpoint of uh, uh, paradigm shifts. And, and what I mean by that is um, in, in the technology, in the technology um, uh, scene that, that we have seen, um, I mainly uh, see basically four different paradigm shifts. Uh, but then again, you know, what is a paradigm shift? Uh, what I mean by a paradigm shift here is that if a uh, uh, if something changes the the human behavior fundamentally, uh, we call that a paradigm shift. So, for example, the the first paradigm shift uh, in the '60s when the personal computers came in, um, we, we all know you know we had you know typewriters and whatnot, and all of that changed, and a lot of people lost jobs, and obviously a whole new vertical of jobs uh, came into play. Right. That was in the 60s and the 70s. And um, then mid 90s or early 90s, um, internet um, came in. And uh, what happened uh, when internet came in? Uh, commerce became uh, e-commerce and, and uh, websites came up, right? Uh, snail mail became emails. So what happened was it, it created a whole new vertical of jobs again, right? And a whole uh, uh, 
a lot of people have actually lost jobs as well. Then uh, the third paradigm shift that I see is uh, around 2006, 2007. And what happened during that time, uh, mobile devices came into play. And, and the computer, the, the entire computer experience that you, that you had basically was shifted into a mobile device. And, and what happened then, uh, you know, the e-commerce, the traditional e-commerce that we know uh, became social commerce and, and then mobile commerce, m-commerce, right? And again, you know, a lot of things happen around that. And a um, uh, 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 lot of different types of jobs were basically created around that, uh, around that paradigm shift. And um, what I sincerely believe is that we are living through a, uh, living through uh, what I call the fourth paradigm shift. Um, uh, this is basically happening around augmented reality, artificial intelligence, um, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, and whatnot. And, and uh, we are basically living through that, and we are seeing self-driving vehicles. We are seeing um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, narrow AI-driven systems like uh, Google uh, speakers and whatnot, and, and Siri, uh, Apple Siri. Um, uh, so we are running into this environment uh, or this new world where a um, lot of things are going to be automated. A lot of things are going to be uh, going to be changing over the next few years. And what I sincerely believe is that a um, lot of the companies and all the corporates have fundamentally uh, uh, sort of uh, have not really understood this. And, and we deal with LIBT, we deal with a lot of corporate entities training various different kinds of employees. And what we are seeing is that um, nobody gets it. Nobody has uh, totally understood you know, where the world is heading. So what happens out of that, um, um, is that there's obviously a skills uh, mismatch, right? And a uh, uh, lot of jobs are going to change, and, and it's inevitable that we have to uh, understand that. And so this is when um, us as academic institutes, educational institutes, uh, have a bigger role to play in this equation. We need to ensure that this is communicated to the companies and also the employees properly, and we prepare them to take on the different kinds of challenges that are coming up. Uh, uh, over the next few years. So we have a responsibility uh, in, in that sense. And, and it is also important to understand that the required set of skills are, are going to change. And some of these uh, specific skills are going to end up becoming generic skills. So what I mean by that is now take, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so take the, uh, the, the job title, the job role, of a typist, right? I mean, if you guys remember uh, back in the 80s, uh, there was a role by the name uh, 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 the, the typist, right? The typist job was to basically, you know, uh, press those buttons and, you know, draft letters. I mean, that was the typist job. And now when you go for an interview now, nobody really asks, you know, whether you can type anymore, right? And um, so these specific skills are going to end up becoming uh, generic skills. And that is extremely important to understand. So uh, when we look at um, when we look at any uh, uh, digital transformation that needs to happen, uh, I mean, it can be in a country or a uh, organization, <clears throat> we're mainly looking at three different uh, uh, pillars, uh, uh, people, process, and the technologies, right? And what we need to understand is that the, the people pillar in this equation is extremely, extremely important. And if you start digital transformations with any other pillar, what happens is it's gonna break down. Any company that started digital transformation efforts with either processes or technology has failed. Fundamentally, it has failed. And um, so you always have to ensure that people are ready in any kind of a, uh, a digital transformation effort. So I think uh, uh, I'm not gonna take a lot of your time. I think uh, the Q&A session would be uh, very interesting in my opinion. Um, so what I would do is I'll be actively involved in the Q&A session. So over to you, Rome, um, uh, to, uh, to get the next speaker. Uh, we'll we'll uh, take a lot of questions in during the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Cesare. And yes, definitely uh, we are well informed now and have a better idea of this paradigm shift that is happening 
in the IT uh, industry nowadays. And so at this point, uh, for all of you who have just joined us uh, right now, if you are uh, if you have not yet registered, please, we are welcoming you. Uh, it's free to join. And if you can register now uh, if you haven't done so yet. And once you are registered, don't forget for your attendance in this participation of this webinar, please put in your name, comma, your organization or school, comma, and your location. And we would like to greet some of the people who have uh, already registered and are here uh, today. This is from Justine Eve Beronio, LPT. Good afternoon. Uh, this is from Misamis Oriental, Philippines. Uh, good afternoon for, for all those in Misamis Oriental. Here is from uh, Miss Melody Valencia Palomares. Greetings. This is Melody Palomares from MAVP Travel and Tours, United Travel Agencies and Operation, Operators Association. Uh, good afternoon, Mom Melody. And we know you've been here in the first uh, webinar, so welcome back. Uh, Pia Penano, Pia Marie A. Penano, STI Dagupan in Pangasinan. To all those in Pangasinan, good afternoon. Uh, Ronald Gonzalez, uh, public school teacher, National Power Corporation Elementary School, Nor Zagaray, Bulacan, Schools Division of Bulacan. All those Bulacanos Bulaca uh, from Bulacan, good afternoon to you. Jesmark Marasigan, Abanico, uh, from Batanga State University, Balayan Campus and Calaca. Batanga. So please take care. Uh, those who are in uh, Batangas right now in the Philippines. So those uh, are some of uh, has joined us. Here, here's another one. Uh, Guinness Marino from the city of Malabon University. Very good from uh, Malabon. Good afternoon to you, Miss uh, Marino. And so please continue to give in your comments. And later on, if you have questions, just jot them down right now in the comment section. We will read them out after all of the speaker's presentation. On to our third speaker. Our third speaker has more than a decade of experience in robotics, automation, and software development. He also serves as a resource speaker for robotics and microcontroller subjects in various universities in the Philippines. After finishing his BS Electronics and Communications Engineering at Cavite State University, and passing the licensure examination, he started his career as an embedded computing test technician until he became an automations engineer and developer. For three years, he shared his passion in the academe as an electronics engineer instructor at AMA Computer College and also served as a research and development engineer for a joint project of Cavite State University and Department of Science and Technology. He is a member of the Institute of Electronics Engineers of the Philippines and a board member and resource speaker of the Electronics and Robotics Club of the Philippines or Phil Robotics. Also, the man. Now you can imagine how nerve-wracking it is for me to introduce him, but I'm also honored to introduce to you my boss in one of the media companies I'm connected with. He is the president of TriPH Media Broadcasting. So please, let us all welcome Engineer Julius Maliari. Thank you, Sir Rom, for the introduction. And good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. I hope that covers everyone in the, in the audience this afternoon. Uh, hello and welcome to this uh, webinar. So as mentioned, I'll be talking about the IT innovations during the pandemic in the fields of internet media broadcasting, as well as robotics. And uh, perhaps um, everyone would agree with me that uh, all of us are already tired with uh, hearing about the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemics in our, in our communities, in our uh, economy, and in our lives in general. So this afternoon, we'll not talk about the uh, negative impacts of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but we'll talk about the positive impacts of this COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, let me just uh, share my screen there. Okay, now you can see my screen and uh, this will be the topic for, for this afternoon. And as we all know, if there's one industry that has been uh, 
positively impacted by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and that's none other than the IT industry, the information technology industry. And we're so thankful to these IT companies that they were able to come up uh, to, to, the, to uh, updated processes and they were able to uh, really geared up and uh, took the challenge and, and really uh, provided whatever we needed to be able to survive today. Imagine without the information technologies today during this pandemic that we are homebounded, we cannot go to work, we cannot go to school. What will we do? How can we feed our families? It will be very hard. So uh, that's why we are very thankful for these IT companies that they, they took the, the responsibility and they really stepped up to provide us uh, all the things and the platforms, the technology that we need to be able to work from home, to study from home and do everything from home and still survive during this uh, pandemic. And if there's one company that uh, has been uh, positively affected by this pandemic is none other than this guy. Perhaps you know this company, Zoom? Yes, so they're, they're, they're just one of those companies that have been positively um, impacted. How, how can we say so? Well, Zoom has been there in, since 2011. It was founded in 2011. And then in 2012, that was the year when, when they, they launched their first application, the streaming application or this video conferencing application. And they started really good uh, in just a year after in 2013, they had 1 million users. But what happened in 2020? Well, guess what? The number of users they had in 2020 is way more than the numbers of users they had from 2013 up to 2019. So that was a great impact and a great positive impact to them. So as you can see here, they had 488 uh, million users or, or their application has been downloaded 488 million times just in 2020. And do you want to know uh, how their uh, finances have been affected? Look at this graph. Yes. So as, as you can see there, this is a big increase. That's 732% increase in their uh, finances. Why is that? Well, because they took the challenge, they shifted, shifted their gear, and they, they really um, supported us and what we need. And that's why Zoom has been very, very popular nowadays as, as part of uh, the positive impacts uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But what is remarkable about this graph, um, folks, is that if you look at this graph, during the uh, first section of uh, Q3 and Q4 of 2020, their growth is, is a bit linear. But then it started to grow at the uh, first quarter of 2021, and they saw the impact, the effect of that on the second quarter of 2021. What does that graph show? Well, it shows that at the, at the onset of the pandemic, they also struggled. They also had their, their, uh, their uh, problems. But what happened is that they, they were able to come up to the challenge. They were able to upgrade themselves. They were able to upgrade their technologies and they, uh, they got the results. And basically, that's, that's the topic that we're going to discuss this, this afternoon. What are the technologies available for all of us? And what are the challenges that we should be willing to take to be able to get these positive challenges no matter how long this pandemic would last? And this is very much the same with, with uh, when we're driving. So you see, when, when we drive a car, most of the times we have the co full control of when we're going to shift our gears or when we're going to shift the lanes. But sometimes it can be forced as well, just like what you can see on that picture on, on the right side. If that white car uh, cuts in front of you, then you will be forced to brake and, and uh, change your gears. And that's, uh, you know, if you tried driving in the Philippines, you would see a lot of that here. So similarly, that is uh, the same thing that happened with technology during these pandemic times. And uh, because we are homebounded, then we were forced to work and study from home. We had to learn how to do it because uh, we're, we're not used to studying from home. We used to have our teachers uh, face to face and we're used to work physically going to work every day. Uh, 
but that brought a lot of uh, positive results as well. For example, uh, we now have more time uh, with our family. So that's one of the positive impacts of working from home during this pandemic. But of course, aside from those positive impacts, it, all, it also had negative impacts or, or uh, challenges. For example, the threats of cybersecurity. Now that we are more online, then we, we are more threatened by cybersecurity. We have a more chance of being hacked or, or, or being uh, under trap of this uh, cybersecurity threat. Another one is the um, idea of being left behind by technology because what happened during this pandemic is that technology went really up really, really fast. And so if we don't catch up with that, then we will be uh, left behind very, very soon. And so uh, that would be the objective of this uh, part of, of my talk. First is we will be talking about the positive results of pandemic, specifically in the fields of internet media broadcasting and robotics. And then we're going to talk about how can you benefit from these changes? What are the opportunities available for you that uh, you, can, uh, you can benefit from? And of course, aside from those opportunities, we also have to know how to, to protect ourselves in the IT world. And um, yeah, so that's the whole objective of this section of our webinar. So let's begin with the first, sub, with the first topic, internet media broadcasting. Now, when we talk about internet media broadcasting, uh, basically it's divided into three, these three, the print media, internet media, as well as broadcasting. And when we talk about print media, we'll be talking about these uh, things like the digital news and articles, ebooks, blogs, and then about internet media, we'll be discussing about social networking, online forums, podcasts, and blogs. And perhaps most of those are, are familiar to you. And lastly, with broadcasting, it's about internet TV, internet radio, and internet movies. Okay, all the things that you can access at the comfort of your homes as long as you have the internet. Now, among all these, for example, going back in the print media, um, one of those that that has been there for, for quite some time already, but really became very, very popular during this pandemic time is none other than blogs there. So perhaps in one of your research, you've come across this uh, blog, uh, tootsplus.com. If you come across that, this is a blog that, that has been uh, established by Colin Stead. And his topics is about software applications and software design tools. And he makes tutorials on how to use them like um, Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, and, and, and all other applications that you can use for productivity in your jobs. And what I like about this guy is that he invites collaboration. He, he invites um, technical bloggers as well as a contributor so they can write articles on his website, on his blog. He posted it and, and he earns from it. And of course, uh, I think he's, he's paying them as well in every article that these people write for him. Now, would you like to know how much a blogger would earn like this guy to blog.com? Well, he's earning $120,000 a month. Yes, pretty big amount. For a blogger and as you can see in his picture he's just doing it at his at the comfort of his house or wherever in the world he, uh, with where he would like to to work from he could be working at the beach and earning one hundred twenty thousand dollars a month and and then another one is uh this uh woman ariana huffington he uh, she created the uh, blog hotspot.com and the topic of this blog is about news and then very easily she became a trusted uh, new site for for many uh, people and that made her the highest earning blogger in the world earning 2.3 million dollars a month just for blogging so you see if you see blogging as as a field or an opportunity for you then why not just have your writing skill set up your website and have a device that you can use to, to write your articles. Could be a laptop, simple laptop, or an iPad, or even using your phone. And it can easily become a passive income. I remember one of my 
previous co co-worker before. He set up a website and he wrote an article about a certain plant that cures cancer. So this guy, he, he has no medical uh, background. He never had cancer. But he wrote about, about that article, an article that he also just found online. So he wrote about that, and then people got interested, and people started asking questions. And of course, who doesn't know the answer? So what, what would he do? One of the viewers was a cancer survivor, and she used that plant uh, and 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 she claims that she was able to that that plant was able to cure her, and she she was the one answering questions after questions after questions of all the 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 readers, and you see she's the one answering the questions, but he was the one earning. So that's that's uh, what what we can have with blogs. It can become a passive income. Excuse me. So the next one that we'll talk about is uh, is podcast. Okay, so this is under the internet media. And for 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 those of you who are not familiar with podcast, basically this is just a digital audio file that you can download from the internet. If you're familiar with Spotify, that's one uh, form or platform where where uh, of, of podcast. We're in. Um, Music producers or musicians can record their music, upload it to, to Spotify, and then people uh, subscribe to it. And, and there, that's, that's, that's how they earn. So that's podcast. And would you like to know how much a podcaster uh, would earn? For example, this guy, uh, Pat Finn, his uh, topic of, of his podcast is about smart passive income, wherein he talks about different strategies and providing advice to people in building their online business careers. And would you like to know how much he earns from this podcast? There, $1.2 million a year. Another guy is uh, Joe Rogan. And, and his topic is the Joe Rogan experience, wherein he talks about anything under the sun, all about his experiences. And uh, uh, because of his very wide variety of topics that made him, uh, gave him a lot of subscriber, and and became the highest earning podcaster in 2021 earning 30 million dollars per year so do you think podcast is for you then go ahead that's another opportunity that you can um, that you can have another topic that we'll talk about are blogs so this is one of the the most common um field that many people really uh invested into today and and a lot of people are now on youtube creating their own blog blogs and one of those guys is daniel middleton daniel um is a video gamer so his blog is about video games and then while he's playing he's playing videos he, may, he makes commentaries like uh minecraft uh, online games and uh do you know how much he earns in in, in doing that simple 40 million dollars per year. And uh, what I like about uh, blogs is that you can do it alone just like Daniel, right? And then while Daniel is doing it alone, another option that you could do if, if you don't think you can do it alone, you could also do it as a team, just like these guys, the Dude Perfect. Their blogs is about sports or and they, they show some tricks, different tricks about sports, or they would play some sports and, and video it and upload it on YouTube or other platforms and there very easily they earn 50 million dollars per year and our winner for the highest earner vlogger in 2021 is none other than this 10 year old kid yes you heard it right 10 year old kid his name is the his blog is ryan's world it's about toys and playing as as what what kids would normally do and do you know how much this kid earns? 10 uh, years old, $80 million per year just for his blog. So as you can see, so there's really a lot of opportunities available for us. Another one is, of course, the broadcasting using the internet radio or internet TV, just like these uh, radios available here. So you could have um, newscast that is broadcasted via internet or you could just play music just like an fm radio would 
or you could have a, 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 an internet TV, just like what TriPH Media is doing, could uh, broadcast it live and talk about anything that interests you or that would interest your audience. So you see, these are the, the available uh, technology, uh, the advancement of information technology, and these are the opportunities available for each and every one of us. Now, while there are a lot of opportunities that has been given by the, the information technology industry, well, of course, it also comes with danger. So now the question is, how can we protect ourselves from the danger in this IT world? Mm -hmm. Well, one of those uh, rule of thumb is be careful what you click for. It's grammatically incorrect. It should be be careful what you click on. But uh, I just like the rhyme. Yeah, be careful what you click for. Now. Uh, why is this important? Well, that's because many of the hackers, uh, the way to, to get information from you or to hack you or to get access to your device is that they would send links or they would send emails with, with attachment to you. And once you click on that, then you will be trapped already. You, they, they would be able to gain access to your device so they'll be, be able to, to get information. So what will be our thinking whenever we are online. When in doubt, don't click. So when someone, a person whom you do not know, sends you email with link or with attachment, you don't know that guy, first time, don't click it. So rule of thumb, very easily. Another one, always check the URL. Now why is it, why is it important that we should always be aware and always check our URL? I'll show you one. For example, this is a very normal uh, banking website here in the Philippines. The URL is personal.metrobankdirect.com. That's the URL. Now, why should we always look at the URL? If you look at this next slide, would you be able to tell the difference among these two? Aside from the other one is more blurry <laughs> than the other one. Physically, they look the same pretty much the same. But if you look at the URL of this one, the original personal.metrobankdirect.com, the other one is not metrobankdirect.com. There. And if you put anything, if you type anything, your username, your password in there, hackers will be able to, to get everything that you type in there. Now, while this is pretty much obvious, as long as you always check your URL, this is more scary, the other one. If you look at this, going back, the URL says personal.metrobankdirect.com. Remember that. Now look at this one. The URL says personal-metrobank.redirectme.net. That is a different URL. That is not the URL of the bank. And that is a fake website, pretending to be the real bank website. And you wouldn't be able to tell the difference by just looking at the, the, the picture or the looks of it. You really have to check the URL every time to be able to protect yourselves online. So again, what is the rule of thumb when we are online? Number one, be careful what you click on. And secondly, always check the URL. And always remember, our safety is our own responsibility. So always be responsible with whatever you click online and whatever you access online always be responsible. Companies nowadays, they have the so-called CERT team. What is a CERT team? Well, perhaps you are all familiar with the emergency response team, wherein when, when there's a fire, when there's earthquake, this group of team are trained to, to handle those, those uh, situations, fire or earthquake. CERT, just put a C in front of the ERT, is the cybersecurity emergency response team. So they are the ones who would take care if one of those uh, people in the company um, are, are, are hacked because what hackers need is just one person in the company that's connected to the network. And once that guy is, is hacked, then they can have access to the whole company as well. So if you are an individual, be watchful, be your own cert, and be careful while you are online. Again, your safety is your own priority. So that's the first topic of our discussion. Now let's talk about the second topic, which is robotics. Now with robotics, we will be talking about, there's, there's a lot of fields uh, in robotics, 
But this afternoon, we'll be talking about just, that, just these two fields because among the fields of robotics, these two fields are the ones that has been uh, greatly impacted by the, the pandemic uh, positively, as well as these are the fields that will really make a difference and change our lives uh, in the future. And you will see that later on. And when we talk about uh, Industry 4.0, we're actually talking about industrial automation, talking about um, Internet of Things, we're talking about microcontrollers, wireless communication. And then when we talk about artificial intelligence, the topics like machine learning and data science uh, uh, would, would, would come out. Now, perhaps for some of you, just uh, reading about these words might sound like it's not English anymore. <laughs> It, it, would, it would sound like I'm not speaking in English or, or I'm speaking in another alien language already. It could be, could be overwhelming for some. Uh, well, well that, that could be true, but uh, I hope that this next picture here will give you a motivation to give uh, an undivided attention and to really focus on what we'll be discussing on the next uh, part of this uh, webinar. This is the predicted shift in skill sets, pretty much like what uh, Cesare mentioned at the onset of his talk. As you can see here, this is the prediction that will happen uh, since 2016 up to 2030 about the shift in the skill sets of people that will be in demand for the industry. So as you can see here in back in 2016, the most popular skill set are those physical and manual skills with 90, um, billion hours worked uh, for this. But look what will happen as predicted in 2030. What would, uh, back in 2016, the, the least work uh, skill set is the technological skills. But what will happen in 2030 as predicted? Technological skills will be the number one, will be the top of, of, on, on the list for uh, for that shift. So you see the paradigm shift, that shift in skill sets. Yeah, so you really, we really have to think about it. So uh, hopefully I, I made you think and uh, you'd be more interested uh, in, in the next discussion. Well, when we talk about uh, robotics and artificial intelligence, really, uh, the, reason, <clears throat> the reason why we think they're, they're very complicated is mostly because of what we've seen on movies. <laughs> uh, they make it sound or looks complicated, very, very complicated. But in fact, if you look at the definition of robotics, it is actually a, a multidisciplinary field that integrates the field of computer science and engineering. And when we talk about those fields, these are the fields that uh, has been integrated by the field of robotics. So what is the, the, the point here, uh, dear friends? It, it goes to show that the robotics field it's not a one-man job. It's you don't have to do it alone. So, meaning to say, if if your uh, interest is into electronics, then you can just focus on electronics and let others do the mechanical jobs, let others do the programming tasks, let others do the wireless communication, data processing, and artificial intelligence. Right now, if you'd like to focus on on just programming or data processing, then just take care about all your data gathering and data analysis, and you don't have to. To worry about uh, uh, exploding stuff when when you misconnect uh, a part of a robot or something like that. So, so there, it's it's really not that complicated. Uh, it it can be learned. It can be studied. And uh, mostly, most of the times, you don't have to really make a make from scratch and make a complicated robotic application right away. Usually, you would start from these educational robots, and you just program that toy, and whatever information, whatever knowledge, whatever technology that you get from there, you can use that to apply for a real life application robot. So you start from there. It's, it's not very hard, it's not very complicated. And uh, once you get that, then you would be able to, to uh, make these uh, real life application robots, like this uh, vacuum robot and the toy robot or, or the companion robot, as you can see. And the picture. So you see, that's the role of robotics in, in, in the industry, to be able to help people. So instead of you uh, doing manual vacuum of your carpet, you just turn on this vacuum robot and it will do all the jobs for you. And uh, what you can see on this 
a companion robot on the right, <clears throat> some people would would buy uh, toys for their kids as as their companion instead of making another baby so that uh, their baby will have another companion. They they find it cheaper <laughs> to 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 do that. Another application or field of our type of robots is the aerial robots or what we call the drones. And this one could be uh, used for aerial videography and photography, but it could also be <coughs> used in a serious uh, uh, fields like aerial mapping or disaster damage assessment, uh, scientific research, or, or even uh, search and rescue operation, as you can see on the picture. And other fields of robotics that uh, you might uh, be interested into or you might need to know is the underwater robots. We're in, as you can see on the picture, it could start from, from a play or from a toy, or you, you could start playing with it, but you could also uh, get really serious with it, uh, used in scientific exploration and, and research, in uh, preservation of underwater ecosystem, as well as uh, search and rescue. Uh, this is widely used nowadays uh, underwater. And of course, um, Another field of robotics is, is uh, these entertainment robots, wherein you make robots just for fun and, and just for, for play. This one is a more serious field of robotics, which is the military robots, wherein they design robots to detonate bombs. I mean, to, yeah. And so instead of putting a person to cut the, the, the wire and to, not to explode the bomb, uh, a robot is being used with that, so less, damage is done to, to, to the humans. And another more serious field of robotics is the medical robots. As you can see there on the picture on the left, uh, robotic arms are used to do delicate operation. So it will be more precise and less cuts on the patients. So less blood loss uh, will, will happen as well as uh, faster uh, recovery for the patient. So uh, that's one of the applications of robots and benefits of having these uh, robots nowadays. Another one, of course, as you can see in the middle on the right of the picture is the uh, exoskeletal robots, wherein uh, robo robotic arms and robotic legs are made for, for the patients. And this is what I, I really like about this field of robotics, because uh, it, it changes people's lives, right? So imagine if, if you, you, you lost your leg, it will be hard to move, and it will uh, affect your confidence, it will affect your emotion. But if you put something in there like that uh, robotic leg, then it, it, you would be able to change a person's life. And one of the fields of robotics that has been uh, greatly af uh, affected and impacted by uh, what we've discussed a while ago, the Industry 4.0 on the artificial intelligence, are these two, the industrial uh, robots. And uh, this picture on the left is a car manufacturing industry. And this uh, picture on the right, is, the, is a, a, a robot that's used in a warehouse of Amazon. And I have a video uh, that I'd like to, to share with you here on how these Amazon robots uh, works. Uh, we, we can ask the help of uh, Sir Rom to play that video. Meet Amazon's newest holiday workers, the Kiva robots. At this fulfillment center in Tracy, California, more than 3,000 of them cruise the warehouse floor, helping employees fill millions of orders. The little orange uh, robot goes out and picks the right pot of inventory and brings it back just at the right time for the person to pick the item out to go in that customer shipment. Before the Kiva robots, the workers used to walk the warehouse aisles picking up the items. But now they stay on these platforms and the robots bring the shelves and the items directly to them. The 320-pound robots can lift up to 750 pounds. They have motion sensors to detect objects in their way and can travel between three and four miles per hour. Amazon says the robot's small footprint allows it to squeeze in 50% more inventory into this warehouse, which is the size of 59 football fields. They've also improved efficiency by 20%, so it only takes 15 minutes to fill some orders instead of 90. On Cyber Monday last year, Amazon customers ordered 426 items every second. Amazon expects that number to be bigger this Cyber Monday. The process at an Amazon fulfillment center starts when products arrive by the truckload. 
The items are sent up to one of the four floors where Kiva robots operate. In this new generation fulfillment center, we have associates who are taking products off the carts and putting them onto the shelves that are, that are, are moved by our Kiva robots. A worker finds a space to stock the item on one of the moving shelves. It doesn't matter if there are paper towels next to board games, just as long as the robots know where to find it among the 21 million items. Then the robots wait to retrieve the item when someone places an order. From there, items are hand-picked and whisked away on miles of conveyor belts to be sorted, packed, and shipped. There's even a robot that folds the shipping boxes. While some may worry about robots taking jobs away from humans, Amazon insists that is not their intention. You're going to see there's 4,000 people working in this building, even with all the automation that's in place here. That's because our focus on automation is about helping people do their jobs, not replacing people. So far, 10 of the 50 Amazon fulfillment centers in the United States have integrated the Kiva robots. In Tracy, California, I'm Kara Suboy, CNET.com for CBS News. Great. So thank you very much. So did you enjoy that video? Well, that just shows how what will happen or what is already happening today and, and that will be normal in, in, in the future. So this is the industry 4.0 that I was mentioning a while ago. So we started with 1.0, 2.0, and we are currently at the middle of 3.0 and 4.0. We're in the 3.0, um, the manufacturing industries have been automated, but with industry 4.0, every single machine in the, in the factory will be able to communicate with each other. Pretty much like that robot that you saw, um, it would, would be able to know where to go uh, and, and not hit each other, be able to communicate with each other. And that's the industry 4.0 and really, the driving factor for the industry 4.0 is actually the artificial intelligence, wherein you get a lot of so much data um, in, in, in the factory or, or in the world, and then use that data to make an artificial brain and to make that, making it the artificial intelligence and making your machine more uh, smart than, than before. And if you remember this, uh, this picture, uh, that, that I show a while ago. This is one of those that uh, we don't have a control of. We really have to, to, to follow and we really have to, to make that shift. So uh, that would be one of the impacts of this uh, technology advancement for all of us. And so what would be the lesson? How can we prevent ourselves um, not to be left behind by this technology? Well, one of my advice is learn to code now. If you are not in the IT field, at least learn even just one programming language. Everyone has to learn how to code at least one programming language. But if you are in the IT field, a minimum of five would do. But uh, if you are uh, interested in robotics, these are my big force of the programming languages that uh, you would need if you would uh, be in, in the field of robotics and automation. And with the field of artificial intelligence and, and data science, these are the, the most common programming languages, Python and, and R programming languages. So what's, what's the key lesson here, the, the, dear folks? Uh, the IT world is, is really, really fast, and it brought us a lot of benefits uh, because we're able to, to work from home, we're able to study from home. But also, it, it has its danger. So what should we do? Well, we have to protect ourselves. And then uh, to be able not to be uh, left behind, we always have to, to really uh, upgrade ourselves as well uh, during this, especially during this pandemic. So that's all. Uh, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to be able to talk with you this afternoon. Thank you very much, Jules Maliari. Uh, that's my boss. And doesn't that just whet your appetite for more information technology uh, learning? You know, how much money people are now earning from vlogging and podcasts. And of course, that shift that uh, we were talking about, the skill shift. As uh, Cesare mentioned a while ago, uh, a typist is no longer existing nowadays. Like everybody is expected to know how to type. And some of uh, the millennials probably 
would never know what a typist is or is there such a job as a typist? Well, you know, fortunately, I am no longer a millennial. I am what you call in the Philippines a feelinial or feeling millennial. Moving along, we're going to uh, look at some of the wonderful comments that we have uh, from Leo Rodriguez Parr. Thank you very much, Engineer Julius Maliari, and congratulations for the very powerful discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Leo. Uh, Fernando Gacosta, this topic will be very interesting to our STEM students in senior high school. Fernando Gacosta, Nueva Ecija. Hello from, uh, for those people in Nueva Ecija. Thank you so much, Sir Fernando. So there are also some questions that we can see already in the comment section. So for Na and Cesare, so you can go ahead and check out the comment section here in our uh, studio. Uh, so you can browse through and prepare for those questions. For those of you who would like to ask questions now, you can do so by giving your comments below. Write down your question and don't forget to indicate who would you like to direct your questions to. So please do that now as you probably have a lot of questions and a lot of interesting topics you would like to discuss at the end of all the presentation. Now, our last but not the least of the speakers is another IT icon. He's an IT icon in the country, most especially in the southern Philippines, Mindanao. For those of you who are from Mindanao, welcome. Some on the IT and EC professionals in the country even jokingly say that if you don't know this speaker, if you don't know him, then perhaps you are not legit. So he finished his BS in Electronics Engineering, Computer Information Technology, Administration and Management at Mindanao University of Science and Technology. He was the Director of Information and Communications Technology, or ICT, Division of the Mindanao University of Science and Technology for around two decades. Well, that says it all. But wait, there's more. He helped in developing IT solutions to many local government units in the country, including his home city, Cagayan de Oro, and also helped develop programs for the events and organizations of many professional organizations in the Philippines. Currently, he is the Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration and Associate Professor 3 of the University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines, Cagayan de Oro Campus. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Engineer Alex Morial. Thank you, Sir Jerome, for that kind introduction. And uh, good morning and good afternoon. By the way, uh, I'll be discussing, Sir Jules, no? uh, a while ago, discussed the positive uh, effect of the pandemic. Uh, please allow me to discuss a little bit of uh, the negative impact of uh, the pandemic to to discuss the opportunities of IT, that IT will here to stay, okay? And eventually half of the, of the discussion, of my discussion, will be focusing on our experience as a government institution uh, during the pandemic, uh, how we proceed with our operations. So it could help also the attendees here, uh, the students, and those who are working in the government agencies. So I'll be discussing to start with, uh, according to John Hopkins University official website, as of August 31, 2021, the total number of cases of COVID-19 worldwide is about uh, 217 million with a total death of more than 4.5 million. So this pandemic has not only affected the health and well-being of people, but of, of course also affected and still affecting the economic conditions of the countries worldwide. So undoubtedly, some of the industries heavily affected are those that rely on personal interactions or those in the travel industry, associated industries like hotels, uh, food and beverage, a even in the local setting, a lot of uh, local businesses close due to this pandemic. And uh, a cascading effect of the effect of uh, pandemic to tourism. Uh, it also impacted a lot of businesses. 
and of course the death for about uh, 4.5 million no it's not uh, particularly we are having this uh, delta variant right now in the country so covid-19 has definitely disrupted the normal way of people's lives the travel ban the restrictions are implemented by each countries of course to protect their borders that's making travel so very inconvenient nowadays so there has been um, a lot of we used to have a vacation but now no more because of this pandemic however despite of the difficulties brought by the pandemic or covid-19 one industry rose up to the challenge and this industry has proven time and time again that this industry is here to stay and will continue to be in existence in the devastating time of facing covid-19 and beyond so this industry is no other than the it industry uh, in fact uh, the, this industry is uh, exempted no they are considered in the philippines the ietf considered this as an essential industry so they are uh, exempted for the restrictions so that they can still operate and if you can notice if one door closes another door opens it's true because the opportunities in information technology um right now uh we have a lot of these uh uh meetings no the disruption of our normal world brought by pandemic impacted every activity that there is or we have before and we are already accustomed to this um online meetings and uh other like online church meetings the telemedicine the online education okay so as discussed by sir jules uh, a while ago that uh, for example zoom so it's not just that spike no of the financial um uh, gains of the zoom because of this pandemic because everybody knows how to use uh, zoom or other platform for this uh, during this pandemic so you see there there are a lot of opportunities and in information technology while we are having this pandemic and beyond what i am trying to say is that i want i would like to 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 review some of these numbers or surveys for example uh, this survey the total number of billionaires no billionaires and self made uh, billionaires uh, this data is as of august 25 2021 the forbes listed around 2755 2, billionaires worldwide which is 660 more than the list a year ago of this number 2755 billionaires 1975 of them are self made and out of the 1975 billionaire, billionaires 10 billionaires occupy in the first 30 places the first 10 spots are occupied by seven billionaires belonging to the information technology sector so you see so there's there's a, a data show that the technology is industry is although it's disrupted however it uh it tells a lot that uh, this industry is a promising industry okay so just try to to look at this uh, number no? this is a comparison of network of the top three tech giants as you can see in the, in the number okay uh, we have this uh, performance of network for the last three years of this uh, top three tech giants for example uh jeff bezos we have this 131 billion in 2019 uh it shows that during the 2020 it also impacted the this te this uh, sector the information technology okay um from 131 to 130 96 to 98 62 to 54 so in the onset of the pandemic these tech giants are also affected however as you can notice we are still in 2021 in the second quarter uh we're in the third quarter i mean but uh, as you can see, 56% increase now based on the network of Jeff Bezos way back 2020 and around the 26% increase. 
and another around 40 plus percent increase of net worth. So this, this means that the information technology sector, this sector has a potential and based on this um, uh, projection, no? as you can see in the slide, this projection, okay, uh, as you can see that the, the projection is steady around the annual uh, compounded growth rate of around 5.4%, uh, as you can see, 5.4% for the IT services market or for the information technology. So, of course, we can say that the IT is here to stay for this uh, pandemic and beyond. Okay, now, in the Philippine sitting, the government uh, supported this uh, IT innovations. That is why uh, we have this RA 11337 or the Philippine Startup Act just to provide the uh, incentives to the uh, startups, particularly in IT, in e-commerce. And uh, the government uh, spent money uh, so to support these startups. For example, we have this uh, a lot of startup incubators. It, uh, it may be owned by private or a government uh, incubator. In our university, we also have one, the City of Bytes. This is a, a technology business uh, incubator that helps our startups in the city of Cagandioro, okay, to, to grow. So we have a lot of vehicles right now. We have policy, we had laws that supports the startups, the IT innovations. In fact, we have just supported no, and helped our, one of our startups uh, develop the QCon. That's um, a video conferencing tool, just like uh, Zoom and WebEx. So that's a local, locally developed, and it's now gaining uh, uh, popularity. And that is, there is, that, that is the reason why uh, our city of Bytes uh, created uh, to help these startup companies in IT. Now, if we can try to look at this, uh, uh, number, the ranking of the Philippines, uh, ranked 53rd across the globe with Startup Link now based on the survey. So it really shows that the this data, that, that really the government is spending and uh, investing so much in helping the startups, particularly in the IT, IT sector. So the effort of the government is not in vain, as this data shows that the results of surveys and researches by Startup Link that Philippines is already in the 53rd, uh, ranked 53rd, okay, in the startup industry, particularly in IT. Now, half of my presentation I'll be discussing in the IT innovations during the pandemic, uh, the USTP experience, just to give you an uh, uh, overview about or background about USTP. USTP is a government um, university. It is owned by the government. So a simple profile of USTP, we are just um, five years old, just uh, a week ago, because uh, USTP is amalgamation of MUST before and MOSCAT. MUST is located in Cagayan de Oro. It focuses in engineering and technology, while MOSCAT is in agriculture. So by virtue of the Republic Act 10919, USTP was born. That was last July 21 of 2016. So, UCP is located somewhere south of the Philippines. Okay, we have uh, actually three major campuses, but right now we're still building the, the major campus. That's the Alubihid campus near the Alubihid uh, Lagindingan, uh, Lagindingan Airport in Cagayan City. So we also have satellite campuses, and this is our uh, estimated population for this 2021. Since it is a government, that's why I, I would like to share this to you, because uh, I noticed there are uh, attendees no, coming from the government agencies on how we tackle and how we survive. Uh, we still operate and, and improve our operations while we are also affected by this pandemic. Okay. So last quarter of 2019, we have a new administration and I am part of it. Uh, from being the director of uh, innovations, I was appointed in the administration. 
to help streamline the operations and to fast track uh, automations in our operations. So we started this by having our own information system strategic plan. This is our plan we crafted way back in 2020 after our new administration. So of course, this uh, plan is um, anchored in the IGO plan, the e-government master plan of the country because we are a government agency. Okay, uh, why I'm saying this because unlike uh, in the private, once the management has decided, they can immediately uh, purchase, they can immediately implement the plan. But for the government agencies, it's not. Okay, our budget will be in a one-year basis. Uh, the budget for 2022 will be will be uh, approved by third quarter, fourth quarter of this uh, year. So that's it. And if it's not located in the plan, it, it cannot be implemented. And how we react to the pandemic? The pandemic, the onset of pandemic last, uh, that was March 16 of 2020. No, uh, March, uh, of course, a lot of uh, innovations are not included in our plan. But because of this uh, information system strategic plan, we already planned it ahead of time. Although we don't know the pandemic will come, but we're able to, to um, of course, somehow being uh, ready for whatever happens. Okay, so our plan should be compliant with the ease of doing business. That's, that is Republic Act 11032. That is otherwise known as the ease of doing business and efficient government service delivery act of 2018. So this, uh, this law measures how the government agency uh, deliver the services to our clientele, to our students, to our faculty, and to our external clients. Okay, so we should be compliant to the ease of doing business, as mentioned, and we thought of doing that through ICT innovations because we believe that ICT innovation is an engine of growth. So. Way back uh, on the onset of the, the pandemic, on the onset of pandemic, uh, that was March 16. How can we implement? Because we are a government agency, we don't have so much as a resources unlike uh, other uh, wealthy uh, gov private institutions that they can, they can implement right away their plans. So how a government agency or an SUC or state university uh, and colleges uh, perform even during the pandemic. Okay, so right away after the pandemic, we accelerated our plans. Uh, a while ago, I discussed that we have a plan for the next 2020 to 2024. But because of this pandemic, we accelerated our plan. Instead of doing that by 2021, 2022, or 2023, we accelerated the implementation of the plans. So in just few months, we set and we created a group of team, what we call the Digital Transformation Team. So this was the creation of this office, the Digital Transformation Office. So I headed this one. So uh, we created uh, more than 50% of this team are young uh, faculty in IT and engineering. And the rest are our uh, contracted employees to help us set up and continue to operate even during the pandemic. Okay, so that was june it was approved by the by the board of the uh, ustp and july we were able to establish our dto the dto is the digital transformation office responsible for um implementing creating projects developing and implementing the the information systems in the university so we are, we don't have so much uh we only rely on uh, we only rely on our budget from the government and of course from our income so that we can improve and we can develop okay so to implement this 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 is our plan to have an integrated information system okay so we have this from the online admission to graduation online payments gradebook clearance evaluation medical dental consultation learning management system financial e-budget planning procurement HRIS, health management, document tracking, and research innovation management system. This is uh, what we plan really to, to do for um, even without 
the pandemic. But because of the pandemic, we were able to accelerate the implementation of this mix of uh, procurement, mix of um, in-house development. So uh, the onset of the pandemic, that was uh, March, we were able to implement a lot of projects, particularly we, we implemented our uh, pure web-based uh, online uh, admission, online uh, admission examination. We also implemented online enrollment. We created, uh, we implemented our new platform, a lot of platform. We created this USTP flexible learning support because a lot of our students don't have internet connectivity. They don't have gadget. How can we implement the, the integrated information systems for academics? So we need to provide them. We need to help them. So we, we, we operate in a Bayanihan spirit. No? We identify students who are uh, very uh, able, but of course, they don't have much resources. So we're able to help them. We were able to locate them. And uh, so that our systems will be implemented and they will also benefit. So we have a lot of services that uh, we, we develop and implement them. One challenge is this one, our own learning management system. We don't have much, that much or much resources to, to, to subscribe for uh, Microsoft Teams, to subscribe for other learning management platform, Blackboard, um, Edmodo, and whatsoever. So what we did is uh, we implemented our own. We designed our, it in our own base on the Moodle platform. So and we called it USTEP, that is the University University of Science and Technology e-learning portal and uh, incorporated some technologies like it's 5p we have big blue button in it so that the online and video for synchronous uh, mode of delivery the video conferencing platform is already embedded in the system so I'd like to ask sir Rome for to play the video a two minute video on what you step University of Science and Technology e-learning portal is an online learning management system that supports the flexible learning program of the university. With salient features management. Teachers can organize their course structure and format along with their forms of activities, resources, assessments, and forums. Accessibility. Teachers and students can make files and other learning materials readily accessible to everyone in the system. Tool variety. The system has a wide variety of educational tools that can be integrated in the lessons such as videos, images, and files. There are also integration capabilities to link URL and other applications such as Google, Microsoft, YouTube to aid the teaching and learning process. It also has a variety of collaborative tools and activities, an all-in-one calendar, and reminder features so teachers and students don't miss any deadline and important events. Live engagement. The system has a built-in chat functionality. There are also add-ins for most of the major synchronous learning tools that can be integrated to maximize the learning opportunities. Mobility. The platform itself is both web and mobile-based application ready and can be accessed anytime and anywhere. Okay, and another integration uh, for our flexible learning program. Again, what is uh, FLP? That's a flexible learning program. Uh, we cannot implement an online learning that is pure synchronous because a lot of our students, we have around 15,000 students and majority of our students, they don't have this uh, much resources for connectivity and uh, gadget, although we're already uh, helping them. Uh, providing them the, the the resources the the gadget and the load for data however 
uh, they need to budget it. So that is why we call it flexible learning program because um, it's a mix of synchronous and asynchronous mode of delivery of instruction. And this new step, we're able to, to also help other agencies uh, for their learning management system because it's free. We just um, created them and customized it to the needs of the agency, like, uh, like us. So we have a lot of things uh, also integrated, like uh, other uh, content management. Uh, example for this one is the Amatrol for our engineering and technology courses and a lot of uh, resources also integrated. Now, that's for the e-academics. Uh, I, I did not mention a lot, but uh, just an example is the USTEP on how we were able to, to do that. Although we're using already USTEP for the past 16 years. However, because uh, we are a government agency, uh, people are not used to, to have that. Uh, it's only voluntary. It's only the IT department, engineering department are using it, and few of the faculty are using in the other colleges. But due to pandemic, they don't have a choice because there's a mandate, there's a policy, there's a memorandum that everybody needs to utilize that one and use it. And that's a, it's a, almost two years that we're um, compulsory. Uh, we are requiring all uh, faculty and students to use it. So. For the e-governance, because we are a government agency, we need to comply with our ease of doing business to our clientele. We were able, during this pandemic, we were able to outright implement our integrated uh, human resource information system for our uh, timekeeping, for our HR management, and for our payroll system. We also continue our accreditation system. We created our accreditation online management system. These are all... Uh, um, these are all uh, in-house uh, development. Uh, we also have our healthcare information management system that's, that is to ensure everyone's health and safety. Uh, I, I'll be talking about this healthcare. This is my, my pet project. I want to discuss this. This is close to my heart because this is serving our students and our faculty who are affected by this pandemic. Although we also have this CIRUS, our online procurement management and supply and asset management system. But I'll be discussing uh, more on the HIMS or HIMS. Okay, so we also integrated um, um, these uh, uh, systems uh, like devices uh, installed uh, in the campus, the face recognition, and integrate the data to HRIS for the timekeeping. And while the um, data for the temperature will be integrated uh, integrated in the healthcare information management system so we collected a lot of data no every time uh, people are coming in to the university we we log the time and we also log the temperature as well as determine if the visitor or the employee are not wearing face masks okay so example of our project is the healthcare information management we're able to provide the lms we're able to provide the delivery of instruction uh, from in, from online admission to enrollment, we're able to provide that one. However, how can we provide the medical and health services to our students if they are not, if we don't have face-to-face -face, um, classes? They are located somewhere in the near, nearby provinces and they're scattered in Region 10. How can we able to provide these services to our uh, health services to our students? Uh, we were able to to create this project now. This is the healthcare information management system. This is an online health information system that we're able to, to do online consulting. And I would like to ask uh, Sir Jerome for a video, a short video for this.
Okay, thank you for that, uh, Sir Jerome. So we have, uh, aside from the module for nurses and physicians, we also have module for our students and a COVID-19 module that we in incorporated uh, for those uh, individuals, the students and employees affected by this uh, COVID-19. So this is for our um, internal uh, requirements for our legal, for those who are uh, forced to quarantine, okay, may, may they still have, of course, salary for that. So we, we have to have our um, documents ready through this system also. And uh, we also, the system also, HIMS also issues a documents after the consultation, medical certificate, laboratory request, and imaging request. So uh, all our campuses is covered with this uh, project, HIMS. Before, we have a lot of campuses. Uh, they, they are very small campus. Uh, they don't have nurses. Uh, they don't have physicians. Uh, with this project, we're able to cover them. Okay? So this is the teleconsultation uh, that we had with our uh, project HIMS. And this is close to my heart because uh, I, I'm the one who is managing this. Uh, this is uh, I'm the program and project leader for this project. Okay, we operated in the Bayahan spirit for the IT innovations that we have, not only for our uh, for our uh, for the purpose of USTP, but we are also helping others who also needs that one. So we're, we're talking with other uh, institutions, government institutions, for them to implement this one, and uh, we're helping them to implement this also. So through collaboration, collaborate with other government agencies, other sectors, who are able to implement other projects. So we have external projects. Example is the PRC contact tracing. They, they, they contacted us and help, we helped them in implementing the medical uh, board examination for medical students, uh, for physicians. So we're able to provide them the help through IT innovations. We also have this external project we call the Mani Passenger Manifest. So before we open our doors, this is our university gymnasium. So we open our doors to our LSI and ROF, returning overseas Filipinos in, in Cagayan de Oro by uh, a vessel, passenger vessel or the ships. So we have a lot of passengers, around 500 per day, coming in in the northern Mindanao because Cagayan de Oro is the hub for northern Mindanao. So we're helping them. We, we open our doors uh, as the temporary uh, shelter for them, the holding areas. However, we're able to find solutions that we don't need anymore these holding areas by implementing this project, okay? So what is PEMS or Passenger E-Manifest System? So this, this project is aims to eliminate the manual uh, manifesting of passengers because they are required, no? The, the ships cannot uh, proceed with the travel without this manifest or passenger manifest. So with the... Uh, uh, with the help of my, my faculty, we were able to provide them and we have a resolution from Region Team IETF uh, to support this project to be implemented nationwide. And we're happy that uh, Marina Advisory, um, we, they, they already required passenger ships to use this one and we are now uh, implementing. Hopefully after a few months of implementation, maybe we can implement this nationwide based on our memorandum of agreement of uh, with the uh, USTP and Maritime Industry Authority. Okay, so way forward, uh, we want to be a smarter university. We cannot just do that because we have a very meager and very small resources. Okay, uh, we are a government university. All our undergraduate students are free from tuition and other fees, school fees. So they are all scholars. They are all scholars. So with the uh, as discussed by uh, Engineer Julius. Uh, a shift. Uh, we need a 360 degrees shift, no, because of this pandemic. We implemented right away. We created a team and implemented this project. So we we are hoping that we uh, USTP will be the catalyst and role model of good governance among government agencies because we cannot just implement the project with with a uh, very meager or very uh, small resources, as well as we are of course uh, complying with the. Uh, uh, procurement law and other laws and uh, we want to be effective and efficient in our administration so that is why we are also providing solutions so we want to help other government agencies and that's what we are doing 
uh, right now. Uh, I think I have uh, one last uh, uh, video, sir. Thank you for that. So we are operating in the Bayanian spirit, and uh, that is why we have uh, we collaborated with other government agencies and private schools and universities. We work hand in hand. We don't need to um, reinvent the wheel because, uh, of course, the, the technologies are already there, and we want to collaborate and share our resources. And other government agencies also are sharing the resources with us. So, of course, like everything else, IT is a continuously evolving whether we are in the face of pandemic or not. But it is more on demand during these trying times of pandemic. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to explore and discover in this uh, uh, in this sector. There's a lot to reinvent. There's a lot to innovate. And one thing is for sure, IT is here to stay. I would like to thank LIBT, the London Institute of um, Business and Technology, for for giving me uh, an opportunity to share, to, to talk about how we were able to, to deal with pandemic. Although we are a government agencies following the bureaucracy of the government and with limited resources. Thank you and maayong gabi isa tanan. Thank you very much, Engineer Alex Maurial. And of course, that says it all. Information technology is here to stay. If you're interested in this kind of information technology course or to know more about learning all about information and technology, please contact us through the uh, websites that we'll be providing later. Of course, at this point, we already have a lot of questions online and we would like to call back uh, onto the stage our panelist, uh, Mr. Cesare uh, Patriani. Uh, Miss Nothain, Engineer Julius uh, Maliari, and Engineer Alex Maurial to discuss with us some of the questions that we have from our audience and attendees to this webinar. So for our first question, uh, this is from uh, Miss Jesh Salvatierra. For Miss No, while most IT courses focus on com competency in the industry, can LIBT's IT course make me business competent as well? And how? Ms. No? Thank you. Um, I'm going to defer this question to Mr. Cesare because his specialty is in IT and he'll be able to 
give you the the most accurate information. So please, need to, Mr. Cesare, can you take it away? Yes, thank you, Ms. Noor. Go ahead, uh, Cesare. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, absolutely, I think um, mainly uh, because we we don't necessarily in terms of the lecturer panel we have, right? We don't really have what we call uh, uh, traditional academics. Most of our lecturers, uh, in most cases, are actually entrepreneurs. So when a lot of these IT students go through these programs, they basically work on various different projects, uh, and and uh, also sometimes work on their own startups as well. And um, us uh, at LIBT, um, obviously startups and entrepreneurship is basically in, in the core of what we do. And we try to incorporate everything you know, that, that is there in all, all the tools and methodologies that we come across uh, in, in the startup context, we try to incorporate into all the programs we do. And um, then, then not only that, and uh, we do have a Slack channel, what we call Instagram, where all the students are in there and we have different channels that they can engage. And absolutely, and and uh, it's not just the the, the standard uh, IT courses that they're going to be learning. Uh, they will basically have a lot of hands-on experience on the on the business side of things as well, mainly startups and entrepreneurship. There you go. Thank you so much, uh, Cesare. Well, let's see a second question from Miss Jelly Fernandez. Good afternoon, Sir Cesare. Which specialization in IT have increased relevance due to the pandemic? Go ahead, sir. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think mainly I, I would probably um, go ahead with uh, uh, topics around uh, artificial intelligence, data science, um, uh, cybersecurity. Um, and, and not only that, a uh, um, lot of the newer ways of developing software as well, like these microservices based architectures and, and uh, technologies that are built uh, around cloud technologies. Uh, uh, systems that are built around cloud technology. I think I think uh, that is getting a lot of attention, and because it's not only the COVID situation, I think, but but also the 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 shift uh, that had been happening, you know, over a longer period of time in the technology uh, space. And um, so I would basically uh, uh, put more focus on uh, a lot of those uh, subjects. And and, and uh, just to just to clarify one thing as well. Now when we we, we sort of uh, generalize AI, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, in a in a sort of a simpler uh, context. But um, when we when we uh, when we say AI, we mainly uh, basically talk about two different areas in AI, and uh, one is narrow artificial intelligence, and the second um, segment is general uh, artificial general intelligence. And um, now, uh, artificial general intelligence is when the AI systems are actually able to uh, operate just like human beings and they're able to think and narrow systems are what we see uh, right now like self-driving vehicles uh, uh, Apple Siri uh, uh, Google Home or, or whatever it may be right uh, the things that we see at the moment and uh, the uh, um, uh, now just uh, just about a month ago what is interesting is that just about a month ago uh, Google DeepMind uh, just announced that they have all the technologies that are required to basically enable artificial general intelligence. So this is a this is a groundbreaking thing, and which means that um, uh, AI systems are going to be able to think and behave like human beings moving forward. And um, and uh, not only that, you know, uh, Tesla just announced uh, Tesla Bot, which is a uh, uh, AI uh, bot, act the act an actual physical bot. Um, so that is ex also expected to come out over the next uh, uh, few months. Thank you very much, Cesare. So for our third question from uh, Jethro Mangaliat. Question for Mr. Cesare. Do you see another paradigm shift in technology with more advanced wearable, further development of augmented and virtual reality, and even elevated machine learning? Sir? I, I, I think that is happening now. I mean, if you um, um, now uh, go Apple uh, is expected to release what they call Apple Glass very soon, uh, which, which is a uh, mixed reality uh, uh, environment where uh, you're able to integrate virtual reality into actual physical reality, what we call mixed reality. Um, and uh, I think what, what you just mentioned that is happening right now and um, what we're seeing is that the, the pace of uh, 
uh, change, uh, uh, the acceleration of change uh, um, is increasing every month, uh, mainly because of the fact that the, the current technologies that are available um, is being enabled, uh, the access is being enabled to, uh, to billions of people, right? And um, that is creating a lot of innovation all around the globe. And right now you can basically start a company investing zero dollars. You can start a company with zero dollars right now. And that was not the case about, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And a um, uh, lot of uh, angel investments and venture capital money is being poured into the system. And uh, we have seen last year, uh, despite the pandemic, um, uh, all the investments in the IT space are at an all time high during 2020. Um, so that is enabling a lot of uh, uh, creativity to come out and, and that enables a lot of innovation. So, uh, um, yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. So another question from uh, Fernando Gacosta. Can LIBT be able to provide support in a school offering STEM program to train students about the basic of robotics or can have seminar in school to inspire students to think about this career from uh, Mr. Fernando da Costa. I think STEM is a Philippine program, stands for uh, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics program. Uh, so who would like to uh, answer this? Maybe we'll ask somebody from the Philippines or... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, Mr. We, yeah, we certainly can. Um, yeah, we, we, we certainly can. Uh, please uh, reach out to either Ralph or John over there uh, in the Philippines. And um, we do work with uh, a lot of companies that are, that are in this space as well. So we can basically, uh, um, uh, we have access to a lot of these companies. Uh, we can certainly be, uh, uh, we're able to uh, put a program like that together. Uh, please contact uh, uh, our Philippines team. All right. Thank you very much. And maybe uh, we can also hear something about this from uh, Engineer Julius. Yeah, um, definitely. And uh, with with us as well, uh, with the help of uh, Field Robotics, we can we can tap them, and we can work with LABT to to provide these uh, seminars to to schools. Okay. Thank you so much. So our next question, maybe. Uh, is from Rob Alfred Mondok. IT is very essential during this pandemic, especially at hospitals or health sectors. How big is the impact of IT during this time of pandemic to the health sector? And if this pandemic ends, will it affect the IT personnel working in the health industry? Um, there's no one directing this uh, question to, but perhaps we can ask some of the panelists. Uh, maybe we can hear from uh, Sir Alex Noriel. Yeah. This um, after this pandemic, it will become the new normal, and this uh, IT personnel will not be out, but uh, in fact, they will become the most valuable uh, personnel in the in the health sector, because uh, right now, uh, although we are um, in the Philippines, not all are implementing. Uh, IT systems during this pandemic, but everybody knows that uh, telemedicine is really the the answer. And IT, of course, uh, not only just get, uh, getting the data from the hospitals, from the patients, but AI can also be uh, implemented because uh, we need to we need to have and artificial intelligence to determine and to fight this uh, pandemic. And uh, we are experiencing right now, like in our local hospitals, they're having this, uh, what we call, they, they do not uh, entertain anymore uh, physical uh, consultation, but through these information systems. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Marial, for that. Uh, we have uh, James Leopardas. Asking us, good evening, due to rapid innovation and technology, how we can guarantee the confidentiality of personal information of those who use the application, whether it is related on COVID-19 contact tracing or any other government electronic transaction. Maybe uh, another one for uh, Mr. Alex. Yeah, uh, example of one of our informations being uh, deployed 
the passenger e-manifest system that has a module for COVID-19 no? tracking these passengers who are uh, infected. Once they arrive in their locality and they were tested positive, we need to inform the passengers their um, setting or uh, uh, with, the, with those uh, passengers uh, who are tested positive. So, of course, uh, we have a law in the Philippines. We have the data privacy law. Um, before we implemented that project, we have uh, to pass through a lot of, uh, um, of course, uh, scrutiny with our partners in the government in DICT or the Department of Information and Communication Technology, in which uh, the National Privacy Commission is under. So we are working with them, uh, consulting with them. They are scrutinizing our, our activity on how we will ensure the data privacy will be respected, particularly those patients who have uh, contacted with COVID-19. That is part of our design and you cannot just implement that if we cannot protect the information in the system. Uh, of course, we have an access list for those user, the users of the system. Okay, uh, who can, of course, they, they have our uh, contract, you know, with our nurses, our our physicians, because they can see the information in the system. So um, they have to sign and they have to be to be committed with the privacy. We have to respect the privacy of our patients who are contacted with COVID-19. Um, we are need to ensure that our system cannot be hacked, although there's a lot of uh, uh, people who are hacking the system and expose those data um, before any information systems to be deployed. We need to be sure because while we are creating solutions, there are bright people who are creating problems to the solutions that we are we provided. So uh, I think uh, Sir Jones can also impart with this. Uh, he discussed uh, a while ago during his presentation, the cybersecurity and uh, the CERT PH, uh, Sir Jules. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Engineer Alex. And of course, we have a request to hear more from the lady in the panel. Uh, maybe we can ask uh, Ms. Na to invite our uh, audience, the viewers now who are watching live via Facebook and YouTube uh, about LIBT. Ms. Na? Hi, everybody. Um, yes, we're, we're here to answer all the questions that you have. Um, uh, please visit our website, libt.co.uk. Um, and we, we have a team of, um, of staff uh, looking after uh, inquiries, and we're happy to help. And we are, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to reach out to um, a number of people in different fields. You know, you might be interested in IT or maybe business, law, education, so please, uh, with the click of uh, the mouse, just visit and, and send us an email, any inquiry. We'll be happy to get back to you right away. And of course, uh, the uh, LIBT, uh, the Philippine teams, uh, is, is there. So um, please reach out to us. All right. Thank you very much, one and all. And I'd like to thank all the members of the uh, panel for this webinar. At this point, we would like to invite onto the stage uh, Mr. John Alianza, the Country Director for London Institute of Business and Technology in the Philippines, to present the Certificate of Appreciation for our guest speakers for this afternoon. Mr. Alianza? Thank you, uh, Rome. So, okay, so on uh, behalf of LIBT, uh, we would like to thank you, Engineer uh, Julius uh, Maliari, for sharing your insights on IT innovation during the pandemic in the areas of internet media, broadcasting, and robotics. So it is now my privilege to present to you this uh, Certificate of Appreciation. So this Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Engineer Julius S. Maliari in recognition of participa participation as a panelist for the session on information technology of 
webinar series, Global Competitiveness Amidst COVID-19 and Beyond, hosted by LIBT Philippines on the 31st of August 2021, signed by Cesare Patirani, CEO of LIBT, and Jan Alianza. So, thank you, Engineer Alianza. Okay, so for the second, uh, so on behalf of LIBT, uh, we would like to thank you, Engineer Alex Morial, for sharing your insights on IT innovation as applied by local government agencies during pandemic, being an essential component and the IT innovation of USTP during pandemic. So it is uh, my privilege to present to you the Certificate of Appreciation awarded to Engineer Alex L. Morial in recognition of participation as a panelist for the session on information technology of webinar series, Global Competitiveness Amidst COVID-19 and Beyond, hosted by LIBT Philippines on the 31st of August 2021, signed by Cesare Patirani, CEO, LIBT, and Jan Alianza. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. John Alianza, the Country Director for London Institute of Business and Technology here in the Philippines. And thank you once again, our dear uh, speakers. So, it is interesting to know that whatever industry we're in right now, knowledge and skills and in information and technology is important to ensure that our business is future are we supposed to be afraid of what the new normal brings to the IT industry? It is very clear from this webinar that as long as we maintain our global competitiveness, we will be able to make it and still find satisfying opportunities now, during the pandemic, and beyond. The London Institute of Business and Technology will help you achieve your global competitiveness and become a global citizen. You can go to www.libt.co.uk, seen here on the screen below. Choose your preferred course and avail of the free 30-day trial. Yes, there is a free 30-day trial. And for more information, you can also contact Mr. Ralph L. Balmaceda, Deputy Country Director at Ralph at libt.co.uk. Mr. Balmaceda will assist you on how to avail the scholarship opportunity, as you will see in the banner below. This webinar may not be possible without the support of the following webinar partners Modala Beach Resort, The Filipino Hospitality, Martin Nichols Consulting, Ralph Consulting. TriPH Media Broadcasting, Bill Robotics, University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines, Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers, Brunei Chapter. And we would also like to thank all the support, the full support of the following officers at the London Institute of Business and Technology. Mr. Cesare Paterani, President and CEO. Tapaung Awar, Head of Administration. Crystal Kohlmeyer, Head of Con Contents and Communications, and her team for all the support and promotions. John Alianza, Country Director, Philippines. Ralph Balmaceda, Deputy Country Director, Philippines. Please note this very important announcement. Issuance of certificates will be based on your registration plus a proof of attendance and participation. Make sure you commented below with your details such as name, organization, and location, or take a selfie with the webinar in your background. Post and make sure to tag LIBT Philippines. You'll receive your certificate of participation within three to five days after this webinar. Upon receipt, may we ask you to post your certificate with your picture, tag LIBT Philippines, and use the following hashtag. Hashtag LIBTPH. Hashtag Act Local Think Global. Hashtag I am globally competitive, as you will see in the sample banner below. 
LIBT Philippines will be choosing posts to be featured by LIBT plus a chance to become the next scholar. What's next? Join us in our next webinar for Business and Management on September 28, 2021 at 5 p.m. Philippine time. You'll see the webinar information in the screen right now. Don't miss it. Mark your calendars September 28, 2021 at 5 p.m. Again, this has been your webinar moderator, Jerome Robles, thanking you all for attending and see you all on the 28th of September 2021. Have a good evening, everyone.